Uh, today we're going to be talking about being who you are. And I'm going to start out by saying each of us are multidimensional beings. We're not just a skin, you know, uh, covering up an ego of some kind. Uh, there's a statement that was passed on to me a long time ago, which is, a holy person is a person who is whole. I would say that again, a holy person is a person who is whole. Uh, I think we have slides that they're gonna play for you. I remember a wonderful lesson from one of my teachers. Um, and he, he said, be who you are. <laughs> if you could, this is what we're here to do, is to be who we are authentically. This teacher got a lot of attention because he got his students to think, to stretch, to grow, and to remember many, if not all of their assumptions and ideas that were passed on to them as, as children came from, um, you know, our parents and from orthodox traditional dogmatic ideas. He quoted, this was Dr. Bill, who I was so fond of, he quoted Camus um, often. Who, Camus commented that the masses of people are usually getting everything wrong initially. You know, there's, there's going to be a thinker that's going to come through that's going to change th things in, in, in human history. It's the way it always works. You know, people go along a certain way until someone comes in with a new idea. And so he was fond of saying the masses are always or usually wrong. They get everything wrong, at least in the beginning. He loved Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson for all the gifts that he shared in his essays. Like Emerson, he wanted us to think, he wanted us to, to own our own power and free ourselves of conventional thinking, programming. He wanted us to challenge us to ask certain questions of ourselves because spirit is always there providing answers if you'll just listen and engage it. Just watch the next time there's, there's a troubling condition that comes up in your life. You can only ask yourself, what's the most, what's the most self-loving thing I can do? And you will always have an answer. I remember as a kid, my father would say to me, um, act as though you, he said, Greg, you, have, you act as though you have a hotline to the Holy Ghost. Of course he was joking. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I always remember that line, is that we do have this connection. He used to call it a hotline. We have a connection to spirit and it's forever available to us. My teacher, Dr. Bill, um, was a bit relentless. He would probe us and challenge us to let go of our conventional thinking, our mass thinking, the thinking we've had all of our life. He would say, there is that which is within you that knows. He says, so give that space. You know, I used to walk around saying, I don't know what to do, what to do about this and I don't know. And I remember him challenging me and the rest of us. He says, there is that which is within you that always knows and has direct, direct access to knowing. If you ask a question of yourself and you just let, let it sit, there's an answer there for you. It comes, if it doesn't, it usually comes right away. Sometimes it'll be the next day. Um, you don't have to look far for answers because you are united with everything that knows everything. Um, other ministers in later years have said we have an internal guidance system. Uh, it's there if we allow ourselves to listen to it. It's there, invite it into our awareness. No matter how hard the world pushes, this is Camus again, and he says, no matter how hard the wor world pushes against me, within me, there's something stronger, something better pushing right back. We have power to use. Ernest Holmes encouraged us to take some challenges to step out in, in faith more. In our teaching, we, we will say it seems endlessly that we are supplied and supported. And we say that all the time. The question is, do you really believe that you are supplied and supported? You know, things come, and do you believe things come to you at the right time? There's a lot of pain <clears throat> and suffering so sometimes it's difficult to think of things working out in divine order. And it's difficult to see how our 
consciousness had anything to do with our life experience. But it's true that our thoughts and our emotions have acted according to laws. And they've acted according to laws that we don't fully understand. People have been studying metaphysics for hundreds of years, and it's not that complicated, and people sometimes make it complicated. I know I've observed that here. Our own dear Louise Hay often would say it's all very simple. It isn't easy necessarily, nor does it, but it doesn't have to be hard. So much of the misery of human life is, is self-inflicted. We talk about the perfect place, being at the perfect place, perfect time. It's one of our sayings here. We're at the perfect place, perfect time. That has a lot to do with life unfolding perfectly according to laws, some of which we don't understand, and you know, some we do, and many we still don't. The challenge is most conventional thinkers don't think out their thoughts and emotions. They don't think that their thoughts and their emotions are acted upon according to laws. That's something you learn here. Your thoughts and your emotions are acted upon according to laws. See, you know, you can think whatever you want, but there's still that fact. That if you're emotionally upset and you've been upset, you're putting into uh, causation. Uh, it, it, it's if, or if I'm negative in my thinking and my worry, uh, you know, I, I'm a human being, I do that, but that it, like is going to produce like. It, see, it isn't like God above is trying to, you know, give you or take away. It's if I have a whole predominant gestalt of feeling and thinking, it's going to bear, bear, bear fruit. The challenge here is most conventional thinkers don't think that their th thoughts and emotions are acted upon. You know, they can think they can think all of this and, you know, it's a new moment now. B but in fact, we, d we do have power. There's power within us. It responds to us. We must continually remind ourselves that our thoughts are things. The tendency of them are re reflected back into our life. Orthodox or old thinking, traditional thinking, traditional th thinking of our traditional faiths are full of, we'll say conventions, belief systems, right? And these ordinary type of conventions are going to produce exactly what you know you, we have believed in, ordinary results. When humankind, wherever humankind has advanced, there was always some type of a rebel or an original thinker who has stood up against the convention of some old theme. I've spoke of it in other weeks when it comes to, you know, the world was flat once upon a time. There were so many um, planets. We've all heard it before. You know, and we used to think everything surrounded us, the earth and all. Humankind, every time it's advanced, has advanced because there was some type of a, a rebel, a scientist, a spiritually advanced person uh, who steps out there. It's an original thinker. And that's always been the way of progress. The masses have always been, you know, where they were. The average or the conventional thinker produce, produce, they produce conventional outcomes. They think, um, Think about it though, how many times do you even challenge your own self about your assumptions? I mean, we, we get stuck on things, like we have opinions about people, people we love, people we have problems with, and we don't challenge things. And you know, here's the thing, if you don't challenge this whole uh, train of thought you have about a person, place, or thing, it's gonna keep playing out the same way. I think we pretty, quickly go towards being right. You know, think of your relationships. And, uh, you know, you, you, I can think of people, you know, we might have had resentments towards, or we've, you know, lived with, and, you know, we've had experiences with, and it's very difficult for us to think of them in a new light. So I think we, prickly, we pretty quickly go towards being right, or thinking we're right about just about everything we think. Isn't, isn't that the way it goes? It's not intentional, but it's just what we do, and it probably would be smarter for us to be open-minded and try to be in new moments with people. Camus said, we are a thinking people, and that reminds me, I think, of um, 
Raymond Charles Barker. He also said it's the job of thinking people not to be on the side of the executioners of the status quo. Meaning, that's really a brilliant statement. It's our job as thinking people not to be on the side of the people who are just promoting the status quo because life is, life is moving forward and w with everything new. So why would we wanna be trying to keep everything the way it was? Um, we don't wanna be a part of it. Uh, we don't want to be a part of what is now called group think, do we? 30 and 40 years ago, people were telling me to turn off the TV. I remember does everybody, Dr. Bill said, turn off the blind eye. And I never thought I would get to the point where I am right now where I remember when I was a kid, it was like in the 70s, I think, I was walking through my mother's house. I don't know who was there, but I remember people were mindlessly watching these shows. Uh, and things like Jerry Springer and all these kinds of programs. Uh, you remember those kind of things and they were on, and do you remember the kinds of topics were on those shows? And, and I was thinking it's really unbelievable that there was even an audience for that stuff. It's equally unbelievable that there's so much, there's, there's so much that uh, is on the airwaves right now. Sometimes I flip the channels and I find it unbelievable. So when the teachers used to teach me that there's, the, the news is rarely good, um, it's always sensational. <laughs> you, you don't turn on whatever your favorite station is normally and hear good news. You hear someone railing against something and it's, um, it's rarely good. And so I remember when my teachers were saying, you know, you can commune with some of the greatest minds that have ever lived and you know, pay attention to where you put your attention. So I started watching it less. You see, there's been a lot of programming going on uh, since we were children. We were programmed with a lot but before we were six or seven years old and it's being reinforced and reinforced and now we do it to ourselves. Um, consciously we turn on the, we use the remote or we do what we do and uh, we pay a price for it. Um, there's information, uh, Dr. Bill said, that we accept because it's been passed on to us by our families, by our teachers, through the media, through the religions. I remember Camus saying that the masses are always wrong. And I totally get what he was trying to say. I remember Dr. Bill talking, you've heard me say this probably five times uh, before. I remember Dr. Bill talking about the Renault, the car, the French car, the famous, and it had a famous slogan, which was 10,000 Frenchmen can't be wrong. Um, and he laughed and he, and he said, um, his, his equally famous answer was, yes, they can be, they sure can be, and they often are. Um, so these were all important lessons for me to, because when we get right back to it, some of these ideas, we want you to know that you, that you are in the world an original thinker. You are an individualization of God life. And you, you are here to discern and dis decide for yourself what is true and what is good. Ernest Holmes and many of his, in many of the authors I shared with you, would prefer that you learn to inquire within because you have the answer. You could ask yourself, what's the most self-loving thing I can do about this particular situation? And there's always an answer if you will listen. Commune with nature if you can, or take some quiet moments, inquire within because there is that which is within you that always knows the truth. We, made, we make a mistake when we looked at, we, at the churches, the dogma that's been handed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. I've studied a lot of religious history and I study the beginnings of these religions and there's usually um, somebody who's in touch with um, spirit with some great truth to share. But what comes after them in the hundreds and hundreds of years that come, come after the, this original person uh, is a lot of stuff, rules and uh, uh, you know, texts and things that you know, people uh, they, they take it as though it's the word of God when oftentimes it's an organization. So we make a mistake when we just look there. 
Uh, Ernest Holmes was saying, you know, the church that you really want to be paying attention to is the one that's within you. Okay, it's not found in churches and books or anywhere else. We don't teach you to honor God above or that you have to do anything to become better here because you're already just about as good as it gets. You are an individualization of God life. You are the whole thing, the whole bit, as Dr. Barker would say. You are an individualization of it. Creative intelligence is operating in you and has brought you far. And you are here to learn more and express more. You're here to have a certain dominion. You're clearly here for bigger things. Humankind is said to be made in the image and likeness of the universe because unlike animals and plants and other creatures, you are able to reflect and think about life in new and very unconventional ways, and life will respond. How spectacular is that? Imbued with creative power, let's, let us let go of old thinking and fearful thoughts. Letting go of conventional thinking is learning to think and do things that please you, that bring you joy. We are beginning to trust this inner self to guide us. Loving yourself, honoring yourself, discovering yourself, discovering the light within. As we do this, all the doors are going to fly open. We're, we are on a journey to become whole, full of light and wonder. You're not going to necessarily please everybody either. You might care very much you know, about people, but you're not, you're, you're not going to please everyone. You're not trying to offend anyone either. You're just attempting to honor your own path. Your need for wholeness might disturb others sometimes who prefer you stay the same way. I find I'm always renegotiating relationships because people are always changing. And I'm changing sometimes. So, you know, you're in, you think is a good relationship and then all of a sudden it's problematic. Well, it's time for you to sit down and uh, listen because someone needs something different. You might or they might and... Uh, Oftentimes, relationships can be salvaged and improved if you really want to, and you take that time, time and trouble. It's far too easy to get angry and make people wrong, and um, then you wind up having separations and divorces and everything else. Uh, I can observe it myself, where I've been thinking partners and friends should be a certain way and live up to a certain conventions and beliefs and the fact is that people are going to do ultimately what they want because they need to. And they're changing and we're changing, thankfully. <laughs> this is where faith comes in. Um, if we're quick with our faith and we're nimble and we can renegotiate many of the things that go on in relationships. If we're stuck and we're, we refuse to listen and we have a tendency to make people wrong ourselves wrong then there's going to be a tendency to grow apart or to have resentments if you're on a call like this most likely you understand that all of life is evolving and changing and so are you if you've come this far and you're in a place like this chances are you you know that okay there's inner work for me to do and many of you will stay because you want to grow and you want to improve um, so you're in it for the duration and You've become a truth student. Um, and if you're new at this, just hang in, hang, stay with it, because life will get better, I promise you, if you stay with it. We do affirmative prayer here. We, we say, um, we do it early, late, and often. We keep working on ourselves here to live the affirmative life so we can rid ourselves of negation or negativity wherever it comes up. Wherever, in any moment, any day, I release the need for this, I release the need and I replace it with something that's positive and true. And we can be flexible enough to allow things to happen and to unfold. We all carry within us pieces of exile. Our crimes, our ravages. This is Albert Camus. Again, we all carry within us places of exile where we've been hurting. Our crimes, our ravages. Our task is not to unleash them on the world. It's to transform them within ourselves and then therefore to others. So look, that's such a powerful quote. We carry within us all these broken places of exile. Our, our ravages, our crimes, our task is to 
just to, you know, spread that upon the world. It's to transform them in ourselves and to see the good in others. That's a very powerful quote. We carry these places, again, of exile and judgment, anger, hurt, all of this, um, all these ravages. In our teaching, we learn how to transform and release them and to see ourselves and others through love's eyes or through the eyes of spirit. Do you understand that these are all spiritual beings doing their best? Do you understand that you are a spiritual being doing your best? It's as though we're in school, all of us learning lessons. At least this teaching makes, comes, makes some kind of sense of it. And we can observe what's going on in, uh, we can observe what's going on in cable news and everywhere else. And you, you could think at first the whole world is coming to an end. When you come here, you learn about the one power that's everywhere present, and you learn that you can use it and that it responds to you. We do make progress. We make progress here in this teaching. There is a bit of quickening that happens as you get involved. You know, things start to uh, get better uh, as you embrace this teaching and practice it. The lessons will come to you quicker as you keep coming back and uh, keep circling around. And sometimes, um, sometimes you know, we think we've learned something and it comes back, and we. we we thought we've learned it, only to see it comes back. And please don't let that bother you. Uh, all is well. Conventional thinking will not bring us where you want, to, want, to, want us to go. It's the people who stay on the path, who continually think great thoughts, who keep connecting in love and in forgiveness. People who keep extending love and forgiveness, who keep the high watch and keep seeing the good and the God in others. Uh, that, that, that are the agents of change. You will rarely hear these folks complain. They're usually focused on where they're going rather than where they have been. Uh, they're focused on where they're going rather than talking about what's happened and what's happened to them. They don't language things in terms of being a victim because they're perpetually hitching their <clears throat> themselves, <clears throat> you know, the, the expression, hitch your wagon to the stars. They're always about what's good. Beware again, Emerson said of the great God, when he looses a thinker, or she, he or she looses a thinker upon the planet, then everything is at risk. <clears throat> He's, Emerson said it's as when a conflagration is broken out into a great city, and no one knows what's safe or where it will end. There won't be a piece of science that might not be overturned, uh, turned upside down. The very hopes of humankind, the thoughts of its heart, uh, and the religions of nat nature. The, man the manner and the morals of humankind are all at the mercy of the new ge a new generation. I can just think of how it was when I was a kid and how th it's changed. And you can only imag imagine how it's going to change and it's going to continue to change. And it comes from original thinkers, people who are in touch with themselves uh, and who are not caught up in everything that used to be. We are here once again to be whole, not holy. Okay. As we discover who we are and develop a, a little bit of self-realization, you're going to realize it's you that's what you have been looking for. You as a whole person. After this realization that I am one with the one, we must practice self-acceptance, meaning we have to accept all aspects of ourselves and, and start to have compassion for others being where they are. Um, we want to be living life this way so we can experience life in a bigger way. There's a shadow side to all of us. There's no point in being in denial about, about it. Um, there is no sun, this is a Camus again, there is no sun without shadow and it's essential to know the night. Most of us, as we do our inner work, become aware of the shadow or the dialogue that goes on within us, the things that we say and do that work against us. And as Jimmy mentioned, as I said in the beginning today, we are multidimensional spiritual beings. Yes, spiritual and living in the physical world as well. To be whole, we must let go of, to be whole rather, we must get to a point of self-acceptance, realizing we're not perfect, but we are unfolding, we are evolving, we're making mistakes while we're growing. 
Loving ourselves is work. Sometimes it's hard work. We must love ourselves even when there are aspects of ourselves that don't, that don't seem to be too great uh, and we don't want to look at. Self-acceptance is the answer. It's the key to all positive changes, said Louise, Louise Hay. We are always where we are in consciousness, and we do the things we do because we want to. Um, it's where we are in our awareness. We release the need to beat ourselves up for being where we are. Just because you made a mistake or a lot of mistakes, it doesn't mean that you are a mistake. We release the need to blame other people for anything. It's our thoughts and desires that are shaping our life. We know that conventional thinking will never go beyond the construct of getting through or, or just getting by. You have gotta do more than just be a conventional thinker. Um, you've gotta think outside of the box and you gotta think, you know, you know, I know the way I've thought about many things in my life and I have to challenge myself, okay? I have to be, I want to be in a new moment so I can see you differently. You know, if I'm carrying a bunch of junk, how can I be in a new moment with you? Think about it, the people you have resentments towards. The rela if you're, ki you're the only one in that type of situation that can change it. Don't wait for the other person to change. Okay, you're the person who has the power, at, le at least because you have the awareness. So conventional thinking will never go beyond where you are and you'll stay stuck in all these places, but you don't have to be stuck. You can be an unconventional thinker. And you can, you can see the good, the God, and people, even when terrible things have happened, you understand that there is a spiritual being there, and they've, they are where they are by virtue of consciousness. You have the power to transform a lot of things, not with conventional thinking, but by spiritualizing your thinking and thinking outside of the box. So if you learn to think the way we're talking about here, um, you're gonna, there's going to be an excitement and there's going, you're going to have wholeness, the wholeness that you want. I see people uh, with a lot of frustration and they don't feel like they are enough. They don't feel like they have enough. They don't feel adequate. They don't feel like they do enough. My goodness, Louise Hay spotted that problem and she must have made many millions of dollars with the book, You Can Heal Your Life. It can completely deals with this whole, this whole inner dialogue of I'm not okay. And so join us on Thursdays for that class. It's always important. It draws a huge crowd. When we're dealing with a sense of not being enough or good enough, uh, we're caught up in an old belief system, an old construct, an old way of thinking, some type of lack, limitation, struggle. Uh, there's conversations of not enough, and there's conversations of lack, there's conversations of limitation, guilt, and blame. When we're in that state of consciousness, even for us who know the truth, we are reminded of the truth. There is an undenying, it's und uh, we're reminded of it. Uh, we oftentimes want to say, yeah, I did it, but because, or yeah, but, and we go into a rationalization, of a story of some kind, and that's how we stay stuck. We're still holding on to something, waiting for something or someone to change or to you know do something first. Um, or sometimes we think we'll be okay if some person, something changed or someone did something differently, we'll be okay. Please don't wait for all that stuff. Just step out there right now and say life is good, life is okay. Be the person who extend, extends the hand of love. You know, we're here on earth for a really a brief time if you think about it. I used to have a close friend who passed away in 1990 and gave me a really powerful message. He said, this is not a dress rehearsal. You know, half these people that, you know, we've had problems with, you know, you, you'll die, you know, never having solved those things. Uh, there's music and there's life in you. And, you know, it, it, you're here to express it. So love radically, forgive often, and just, you know, <laughs> be that person that can extend that love. Um, just stop waiting, right? We oftentimes put, put, on, put on masks, you know, and you've heard me talk about it before. And we act as though everything's fine and good when inside we're dying and inside we're hurting. Uh, I know I've done it before myself. I'm sure other people have. It's incredibly unfortunate that we do this. We have momentarily forgotten the teaching and our connection to this universal mind and supply. There, are, there is so much good right now, and yet 
How many of us really can truly feel that, that, that we, we're, we feel the good that's here? The beauty, the power, it's all here, but we're caught up in our feelings and our emotions. The truth is, it isn't going to get any better. <laughs> Uh, these are the these are the good old days. This is really this is you, right now. You're at the highest point of your whole development. So if you're stewing in feelings and thoughts and stuff, find the way within yourself to stand up. I'll look Taylor Swift. Shake it off. Do something. Say I release the need for this um, because this is my day. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day where all things can be different. This is it, right? This is it, and how sweet it can be. That's Jackie Gleason, how sweet it is. And once you learn this thing called principle <clears throat> and how it works and get excited by it. <clears throat> Today I'm reminded of David Walker, who was one of the best of the best teachers. And he drummed that word in my head many, many years ago. Uh, he's the person I think passed me on my exams uh, to become a minister. He was famous and he was humorous. Uh, and he said to me, your job, Greg, is, is to go out there no matter how you're feeling like today and get as excited as you can about principle, divine principle. He says, if you do nothing else, get out there and tell those people how good life is and life is responding to them. There is a principle, a divine principle in operation here, and it is responding to you. It is responding to you. And so I'm trying to get myself excited enough to tell you what I know to be true. Life is responding to you. And... I'm supposed to share my excitement with everybody who would listen. So there it is for today. Life is responding to you. Are you saying, um, I'm saying you have this thing within you called divine principle, which is really the very act. It's an action of God, and it's responding to you all the time, 24 hours a day, because that's what it does. It's that, that's what life has to do. You remember the movie, The Secret. Your wish is my command. Life is responding to you. It has to. It's what it does. It doesn't necessarily give you what you want. It's responding to what you believe and what you know. So that's what it does. You don't have to look for it in the holy books. You don't have to run off to the churches. You don't have to listen to me anymore. You don't have to tune in anywhere. You have direct access to everything you need. Um, David Walker reminded me to get excited about it, and I'd see it when I this lesson as I was preparing. I thought, yep, that's what I got to do tomorrow, no matter how I'm feeling. I'm going <laughs> to go down there and get excited about it because this is what life does. It responds to us. So let me pass that on to you today. Get excited about it, and then commit yourself to it, remembering it's there. And practice, live your life as though it is there. I am supplied and supported and get excited about it. Ernest Holmes did not promise us riches anywhere in our text that I could ever see. Nor did any of the other New Thought teachers. We become prosperous, many of us, because we practice the teaching. But it was it, riches and all of that was never promised. Ernest Holmes promised that we will get better control over the conditions of our life. There is power for good in the universe and you can use it. We can achieve better control over our health, wealth, and external circumstances. This really is saying our life circumstances can and will change. They will change as our attitude and our outlook changes. Only when we become more whole, more peaceful, more loving, all of these things. Only when we do this, our outer world and circumstances change. Our teaching is powerful and it's practical. The universe cannot do for us what it cannot do through us. If I'm not a loving person and I'm full of hatred and anger and bitterness, how the hell can the universe bring forth anything good through me if I'm seething with all of these um, qualities of disconnect. The universe can't do for us what it can't do through us. So for me to demonstrate the kind of life that we're all wanting, I have to be open to change. I have to be open to let go of resentments and anger and bitterness and jealousy and you know gossip. And I really got to be that. I have to be the thing. Because if I'm that, 
if I strive to be that, then the, I'm opening up channels in mind and this divine principle can and will respond to me. Like will produce like. For me to wish and hope other people are gonna change, do you think that's gonna ever work? You think I'm, you know, if I wanna traumatize myself with what's on television every night and I'm, that I'm gonna sleep on that all night, I gotta have the wisdom to cultivate a consciousness of positivity, to hang out with people who will support me as I move forward, who will tell me when I'm off base. Our teaching, again, is very practi practical. The universe can't do for us what it can't do through us, so I have to learn to be the channel for the, that love to pass through. Please stop begging and pleading for any kind of God anywhere to change anything. Anything. It doesn't work that way. The spirit that's alive in you can change things dramatically. You can change your perceptions. You can. Think of all the times you've just been stuck on about something. You have the ability to change that. Your reality can change. You can think about yourself in more loving ways. You can think about others in a more loving ways. The power is in you. You can heal your life. The universe has a tendency to mirror your predominant thoughts, especially when you've learned how to think affirmatively. Because when you're thinking affirmatively, you're thinking the way of the universe. When you're thinking negatively, you're going against it. So the universe has a tendency to mirror your predominant thoughts, especially when you have learned to align yourself with life. When your thoughts are about wholeness, oneness, power, love, and beauty, where nowhere in the textbook does it say it's gonna all get better. Your consciousness is the thing that's going to expand. If you contemplate wholeness and health, unity, oneness, and in earnest, if you practice peace and love, your consciousness and your understanding and your attitude will change if you approach each moment, each day, with calm certainty and you attempt to maintain this peace. I keep on telling myself throughout my life, I, can, I could see peace instead of this. I've been probably saying that for 40 years. It's always, you're at choice so much, so many days we're at choice, and you can say to yourself, I, I could see peace instead of this. If you make those choices, you're gonna have dramatic results. Your, your life is gonna change. I can see love, I can see that this person is doing the best that they can. I don't have to pile on and talk crap about them. Do you think that's gonna change anything? The only thing it does is it keeps me stuck. Uh, I could see peace instead of this. If you do this type of thing, this will have a huge impact on your life. If you get excited about this divine principle and know that this principle of life is responding to you. Some great metaphysical teachers would say that life is like a great school. We all have obstacles, <laughs> can't escape them. No matter how you progress or rationalize it, at some point we, le we, we learn that we're gonna leave our bodies. Nobody really likes to talk about it much, but it's something that will happen. I don't talk about this much because sometimes it's upsetting to some, but there's some value in meditating about it, about it a little bit. Alan Watts always suggested great things come from it, occasionally from doing it. Sometimes if you contemplate, you know, that we all have a day where we're gonna move to another dimension, it orients our life and it causes us to get more focused on doing and being what you were meant to do here. You can get focused on what's important. Because God, we, the time we waste is unbelievable with what I used to call trivial pursuits. We have plenty of time in life, but why waste it? We spend a lot of time doing things that aren't terribly important. And we have to try to show the world something or prove to people that you're okay or show the, keep up with the Joneses, show people that you're this or you're that. Uh, I remember a time in my life, you know, I had a lot of different things. And it's just, the things that I was uh, acquiring, say it that way, and pursuing, I really don't even know, you know. But we spend a lot of time, um, you know, it could be with material things. Or we spend a lot of effort trying to change other people or change other people's thinking. Jeez, please stop. Save your breath. This might be... <laughs> I could, I'll do Barker's talk in another week of, about how to change other people. In the end, you're gonna realize he's gonna say you can't do it. So stop trying to change other people. Save your breath.
right? And that's supposed to be a joke. And the thing that's always going to get better here in this teaching is you. And you will coast along with more and more peace and happiness and joy. There's something new that is happening because there's always new things happening. Um, uh, there, there it is, a, a new lesson or another lesson. And, and beyond lessons, we get more lessons. Uh, that's one of the great things about this teaching. As you commune with life, you're going to realize every day that something's going to present itself and there's going to be something to be excited about. The process of life itself is liberating because you, it keeps on expanding and growing and changing. In this teaching, we, we are clear. Nobody can make us better. Our value and worth are already established. You couldn't be any better. You couldn't be any more good. You're an individualization of spirit. That means you're one with God itself. It's a certain type of person that comes into our classes and comes into our lessons and stays. I'm going to tell you straight up. Most people come, they like, but they realize after a while, oh my God, you know, I have to do the inner work, and they don't want to do the inner work. Because the inner work means I've got to forgive you, and forgive you, and forgive you, and I've got to forgive myself, and I've got to learn to be peaceful and less warlike, and I need to see the world as being beautiful, whole, and complete. And, but I want to go into the ain't it awful and what people have done to me. And I'll, you know, it's not everybody that's going to be willing to do that kind of work who come to, <laughs> come to the center and do the work and stay. And there are a few, once they, once they get onto this, they're going to rarely miss a class. I've had students, they won't care what I'm teaching, where I'm teaching, they're going to tune in or be there. It just doesn't matter what subject or how it is. There's a few that will rarely miss. Some realize how important the work is, the inner work, and they will dive in and they will take our classes, they will take other classes, Many will realize that they have done a lot of work and study, or after they've done a lot of work and study, um, you know, they're going to realize how good this is. Humankind, by the way, is a funny species with such amazing gifts. We are the only creature that refuses to be who we truly are. Something to think about. The zebra doesn't have a problem being a zebra, and the horse doesn't have a problem being a horse or the bird. We're the only creature that really <laughs> refuses to be who we truly are. I mean, you're gods, you're aspects of God. You were made in the image and likeness, meaning you have the power to decide and to choose and to create and co-create. How great, how great we are, what gifts we possess, yet we don't embody them yet. We don't embody it yet or enough. The masses, again, are out there, you know, you know what they're doing. I don't have to talk poorly of what the world condition is. But you know, you who are here who, and who can understand, you've been given such a great gift. You know that, you know, the thing that everybody has seek, been seeking through the millennia is the power, uh, the presence is in you, operating through you, and it's responding, it, responding to you. Um, so people don't embody it completely or enough uh, we come here and we know we're not practicing it or uh, coming from this place as much as we could. Uh, our eyes are open here today. We know that we can't lose with the stuff we use. We're taught not to make our life about anybody else. Stop explaining what you're doing because of some other person, please. Um, we're taught not to make our life about other people. As you come into this teaching, we know if change is going to take place, it's going to come through our consciousness our expanded consciousness, our willing to forgive, our willing to, willing, willingness to extend love. Some of you might be inspired to take a second or third class. Um, you're beginning to do the work, you're getting some results, and a couple years later, there's still this feeling, I don't apply it enough, or I, I want to practice it more, and that's probably true. Um, a lot of us do that. I have a big question for you today as I start to do my wind down how do you feel about your ability how do you feel about your ability to see life as being really good do you see life as being wonderful and good are you good at knowing how sweet it is how good it is is that how you face everything i have a friend i talk to i have a couple friends and generally the conversation is how rotten things are and i'm always trying to switch that around 
You know, because the thing for us as religious scientists, as truth students, is just find the good, see the good. There's an old joke about, you know, there must be a pony in this someplace. You know, there's like a pile of manure. Somewhere in that pile of manure, there's, there, there must be a pony in this someplace. Our job is to see the good when the good isn't evident. Life is a process, and in it, everything is changing. Everything we cling to is changing. People who are spiritually mature live in a multidimensional uh, life. They have faith and a quiet happiness. Uh, they're strong people and they're loving. They're wise and they re rely on an inner knowing and guidance. We over time with practice can learn to exercise authority in our own life and emotions. We can be, we are the cheerleaders of life everywhere. We're here to say, good, Nancy, good, 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 Betsy, good, Glenn, good. We're here to see the good in people, good cat. Um, that's what we're here to, good, to do, is to cheer people on. We have compassion for people, even when people are out of sorts. We absolutely care about them. We know, though, that we do our work in consciousness by realizing our connection with Source. And because we have this connection, this awareness, you know, we know it's in everyone. We understand spirit and life is unfolding perfectly in ourselves and others. We have a certain dominion over circumstances because of this knowing, because of this connection. We realize that in the final analysis, we're doing what we want, what we choose. For example, if people show up being rude, ignorant, rude, you know, and just cantankerous in our life, uh, or even if they do worse things, um, if I were really empowered, or you were really empowered, um, you most likely won't react to people acting out, right? Because your healthy so self will equivalently be saying, what does that have to do with me? This person's acting you know, like they're acting. What does that have to do with me? I don't want to react to foolish behavior, do you? Uh, in these situations, whatever is taking place is a statement of someone's consciousness. This is where they are. Let your healthy side, your side that's with connected, take it under advisement. If there's something for you to learn, yeah, take it under advisement. Maybe there is something for you to learn. Um, and then maybe approach the person when you're calm or they're calm. And, but always understand that people are where they are. Not because they're bad, it's because of where they are in consciousness. Refuse personally, to be offended. People react and people act out. Try not to take what people say personally. It has really nothing to do with you. They don't mean it half the time. Furthermore, my job, your job is to let it go and to be in a new moment. Say to yourself, I can see peace instead of this. We can see peace instead of this. I can see this behavior as what it is. It's a cry for attention or help. Dr. Bill used to say, my healthy side will <laughs> take this under advisement. He rarely reacted to anything. You know, so that's on a good day. You know, sometimes we're going to react. But there will always be days where we will forget. Because we're, while we're here in a body, we're human. It's a privilege, first of all, to be here in a body. It's an instrument we use. We intend to love ourselves wherever there's disharmony or disease. Uh, wherever there's disturbance, we're going to bring forth love and spiritual knowing. We release the need to criticize ourselves or anyone else who's experiencing an illness or any disease. Once again, we know the truth and we focus on wholeness. You all know that Louise Hay always comment, commented the word should is the worst word in the English language. I talk about it often. I'm going back to today's talk. Be who you are. In that talk, uh, Dr. Bill had a strong, strong thoughts about guilt, thinking guilt was the worst emotion to hang on to. Not fear, but guilt. I'm aware that some of you might argue that there's some need for guilt, and maybe so if you've made a serious mistake, at least enough for you to make a correction. It can bring you to a place of reassessing it all. And if there's an acceptance that you've made a mistake, Seeing and working through that shadow part of yourself is valuable. Uh, learning, this is really what, what it's all about ultimately. 
has value. We want to know what is working against us in consciousness and not repress it. We don't, however, want to keep beating ourselves up or punishing ourselves over and over again for things that we've done uh, in the past. We must find a way to forgive ourselves and forgive others, to let go of the guilt, the self-flagellation, for us to have lasting change. Unless you understand all is well and comprehend the perfection of what is here and now, unless you get this essential peace, all is fine, all is well, all is perfectly unfolding, you're going to be living with the idea that something is missing or wrong or not okay. Not good enough, and you're going to be telling yourself a story. And as long as you're in a story, you can't change. Okay? You are with the conventional thinkers. Know with me that you are a point of awareness in perfect life. There's nothing you need to do. There's something, there's only, there is something for you to know, and that is all is well. Accepting what is, um, shadow or behavior, will liberate you. You know, you accept yourself. Okay, I have some problems, and I'm going to change them. Forty years ago, a brilliant person came into my life. I didn't know how important his message was. He told me, I remember it to the day, everything is perfect. And I looked at him like he was crazy, because it was a time in my life where nothing seemed to be working. Everything is perfect. I've been thinking about that message for over 40 years. We're always in the perfect place, perfect time. It can be no other way. I'm also reminded of a passage from 12-step literature that has stood the test of time, which is this. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. I will find no joy, no peace, until I accept that person, place, that entire situation is being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in the universe by mistake. We must focus on knowing the perfection of life that's always unfolding by means of us. It has to be by means of us, right? You're the instrument that changes it. Life, by the way, presents us with the same lessons over and over again. Have faith, you will learn them. You'll learn everything you need to learn at the perfect right time. You won't get them all at once, right? Um, you're not responsible for other people's problems or lessons either. We learn self-acceptance. We learn to accept our problems or challenges knowing that they're lessons in consciousness. Dr. Bill, in his great talk on this subject, next looked at the word um, altruism, which he didn't, he said it's kind of a phony word. He says, I do what I do because it gives me pleasure. It pleases me to do it, and that's what people do. Um, he said, I've been listening to psychologists that talk about this and debate this for years. And in the book, The Art of Selfishness, um, which he read and talked about from time to time, he said, any way you cut it, um, if you're acting you know, friendly towards other people, you're getting a benefit from it. So the book challenges us to be smarter and perhaps a little bit more assertive and stand up and start to live our best lives. Um, please stop explaining your life away. I did this because and because, I, and I didn't do this or I didn't do that because of some other person, place, or thing. You've done what you've done because it's what you've wanted to do at the time. Take, uh, that's taking responsibility for your life, right? It's not having a victim consciousness. From an elevated position, if you choose to assist another, uh, the self is giving to the self. So if I do anything here for anybody, it's, you know, I'm giving to, it's me giving to, I'm one with all of you. It's me giving to, to God. If you're doing it with that awareness, and if it gives, gives you pleasure, good, do it. Um, if you're doing things out of a sense of obligation or duty or guilt, uh, that's something else. Be who you are. You are good. You're wonderful. There's no. There's no. Uh, there's not enough to words to describe your, how good you are, how valuable you are. You are a point of awareness within the mind of God, and you're here to transform your life and the world. And so it is for this morning. Thank you very much.